Well, hello, Calvary. Whether you are watching online or joining us in person today, so glad that you are here. Uh, Rhonda and I are away today for a family commitment, but I am honored to introduce to you who will be bringing you God's word today. Pastor Matthew Ford not only grew up here at Calvary, but uh, for the last eight years or so has been leading our CSM, Calvary Student Ministries, and uh, I'm thankful for him, thankful for his ministry, and I know for a fact that he has a message for you today that is gonna cause you to not only think about your own life in, in maybe a new and challenging way, but also encourage you in the plans that God has for your life. So Calvary, would you do me a favor, stand to your feet and give a great big Calvary welcome to Pastor Matthew Ford as he comes to bring God's word to us today. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Well, hello this rainy uh, morning. <laughs> it's good to see you all. and. Yeah, like Pastor Chad said, uh, Matthew Ford, I've been the pastor here for eight years, believe it or not, which is wild. Pastor Jay and I started in September of 2014 and uh, officially on staff uh, April of 15. So it's so great to be with you this morning. I'm excited for what God has for us today. Uh, I wanna show you my little family that I have here, throw a picture up on the screen. Uh, so I'm married to my wife, Tanya. Uh, she is, oh yeah, here we go, so my wife, Tanya, We've been married seven years as of August 22nd. And then this is our daughter. Uh, her name's Selah. Uh, that's from the Bible. It talks about pause and rest. And that was kind of our intention behind it. It's just kind of a breath of fresh air. Funny enough, she was born uh, Aug uh, August, April 1st, 2020. So <laughs> April Fool's Day 2020, we named her Pause and Rest. If you want to blame me so you can sleep at night, it's my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, careful what you name your kids. So, uh, yeah, so uh, that's, that's my family. And what we've been loving doing lately this year is uh, taking our daughter to Cedar Point. Now, she's only two and a half, but she's tall enough to ride the kids' rides. And so we've been going, and you know, she, at first it's fear, then it's fun, but she goes around in circles on the different rides. You know, I ride the train with her, all that fun stuff. But it's cool to be able to go to a place that gone a million times, right? I've been to Cedar Point a million times, right? rode the rides a million times. But to see the joy on her face and the excitement that she has uh, experiencing these things for the first time. And so if you've experienced that before with your grandkids, kids, family members that you might have taken to a place, it's a cool experience to see them experience it for the first time. And today, my hope for you is to bring you along on a journey of something that God's been doing in my heart and speaking to me uh, that I hope will encourage you. And I hope to see the joy in your eyes as you see what God is doing in your heart and in your life through his word. And I'm blessed to share this with you guys. And uh, I've just been on a journey about talking about questions. So today, I don't wanna give you all the right answers. Right, you can do a Google search to find some sort of right answers. I'm, my hope for you today is to have you leave with the right questions. And I wanna share with you today one question that hopefully will change your life. Now, there's something really interesting about God's word. In the New Testament, it is recorded that Jesus asked over 300 questions. Three and a half years of ministry, 300 questions. He was asked 180 different questions. Can anyone guess how many questions he answered out of the 180 that was asked, the answer directly? Three. All the rest of the questions he either answered with another question or he just ignored them. Today, I don't wanna give you the right answers. I wanna give you the right questions. See, questions are powerful. See, questions can reveal motives. Questions can help you understand identity. Questions can help you defer, determine if you wanna trust somebody or not. Questions can focus your mission. Questions are powerful things. You might even be thinking of some powerful questions right now, like, why did I skip breakfast? <laughs> or, where's Pastor Chad? <laughs> right? I mean, let's just all say it, it's here. Should've brought an elephant. Where's Pastor Chad, right? Or maybe, are the Buckeyes gonna have a good offense this year? I would have never thought that until last night, right? All the Wolverine fans are like, it's our year, two in a row. Um, 
But there seriously are some powerful questions that we ask. You know, at working with teenagers, kids actually get annoyed with this question. What are you gonna do with your life? <laughs> Sophomore, junior, senior, now it's like seventh graders. What are you gonna do with your life? It's like, I just learned how to walk. How do I gonna know? Well, they hear these questions, right? What am I gonna do with my life? Or maybe there's a question of, will you marry me? That's a question that'll change your life. Especially if they say no. <laughs> what if someone asks you, do you love your job? That's a question that'll make you think. Or what am I gonna do in this next season? You're in transition, you don't know what's next in your job, in your family, in your life? Or maybe is there anything left for me here? Questions are powerful. And the one question to change your life today I wanna to ask you is why are you here? Why are you here? Now you can take that a million different ways and today I'm gonna to break it down a little bit into some questions that Jesus asked, but I really want you to consider why are you here? You can say, well, at church? Sure. Next to those people next to you? Sure. In your neighborhood? Sure. At your job? Yeah. Why? Why are you there? And I know that this question will change your life. Because I work with teenagers, I know that they're always asking this question of purpose and of mission. What am I supposed to do? Why am I here on this earth? But I'm not too naive to think that that question goes away when all of a sudden we get a real job or we go to college, right? Every season, we have to ask ourselves, why are we here? And so I'm gonna break it down into four different questions that Jesus asked in four different stories in the New Testament to help to identify aspects of this question of why we are here. So four questions from Jesus that you could use to re reveal why you're here. Question number one I wanna share with you today is the motive question. Jesus asked the question, what do you want? What do you want? Now, uh, you know, everyone, when, when, you go, when you go on vacation, you kind of have like these traditions, like things you always do, right? You go to the same place or you do the same things, you eat at the same restaurants. Well, my wife and I have a tradition whenever we go out of town that we do now that our you know, daughter goes to bed and we're stuck in a hotel room instead of you know, walking on the beach you know, or enjoying, you know, nice restaurants, you know, we're eating at McDonald's and we're going to bed at seven. And so we have, we have a tradition now. We, and it's a spiritual tradition. I, I, I don't promise. Uh, we watch a TV show at night to waste our time and it's called Impractical Jokers. Anyone seen that show? There's just something about sitting there watching this show that you've seen a million times and laughing over and over again. If you have never seen the show, it's about four friends we do dumb stuff. They're way too old to be doing the things they're doing, but it's hilarious. And they just do all kinds of wild things. One of the episodes, you know, a lot of the episodes happen in grocery stores, but one of the episodes I recall that was happening in a grocery store is what they would do is as someone was going to grab an item, so they're going to grab a loaf of bread, another one would come in and steal the bread right before they would grab it. And so they would follow around this person and kind of like, and then like look away and act like they didn't know what was going on. So they kept doing this over and over again to this one lady till the point where she turned around and she said, probably guess, what do you want? Right, someone was following you around the store, you'd probably be creeped out. They kept grabbing the things you wanted. You'd be, feel like, oh, this is really strange. And you'd probably at some point ask them, what do you want? Why did, the, why did she ask, what do you want? She wanted to know this guy's motives. Now for him, it was for the laughs, it was for the show, it was for the money, whatever his motives were, but that question revealed his motives. John 1, so we're, we're gonna start in John chapter one. Like I said, we're gonna go four different stories, kind of snapshots of Jesus' life throughout his life. So John 1, we're gonna pick up there in verse 35, it says, the following day, John, which is John the Baptist, was standing again with two of his disciples. So he had two guys who were hanging out with him. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him being Jesus, and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Okay, great. Let's, let's read verse 38. Jesus turned to them, and he said, what do you want? 
They're following Jesus, the Son of God, the one that they're supposed to follow. And the first thing Jesus does is turn around and say, what do you want? Wow. Now, in the, in the English Standard Version, a different translation, it kind of pulls out a different idea from what the, what the Greek is trying to say, where it says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? Why are you gonna follow me? You're hanging out with John, he's baptizing people. Why are you gonna switch to me? Jesus wants to know their motives. What's interesting is this word for seeking or want in the Greek is this word, zeteo. And I feel like it's very useful to see this word because it gives us a sharper definition. It says to seek, to search for, or to desire. Jesus is saying, what do you want from me? What are you looking for by following me? I might ask you the same question. What are you looking for in following him? Jesus. What are your motives? What's your goal? What are you seeking? I mean, you came here for a reason, right? So why are you here in these seats? Next to these people, maybe you know them or not. I'm not even guaranteed that you like them or not. You might have fought with them on the way here. You're like, I don't want to drive in the rain. I want to stay at home. Right? Singing these songs, listening to someone give you a word from God. What are you looking for? Because if you know your motive, it will enrich what you're going to receive. See, if you're here just because it's something you're supposed to do, or you're here because that's what you've always done, or you got to save face, save face, or it's a status thing, or you want people around you that you know here to think that you have a good life, but really you're just really a mess and struggling, or you want to hold up appearances so you show up to church. It's not going to give you what you're looking for. And I'm not saying that to you. I say that to teenagers every single week. And once a week, show up to church, listen to someone talk, sing a few songs, and leave is not going to give you the fulfillment you're looking for. And so I think that's why Jesus said, What is your motive? What do you want? See, as two good Jewish men, they would have known that being in proximity with a rabbi would make them look good. And so Jesus said, hold on. You can follow other rabbis like that, but following me is different. So Jesus knew that proximity with him would not equal relationship. He knew that there's no friendship status without sacrifice. And you can't follow him without knowing him. He said, hold up, you can't just... Be with me. You gotta follow me. So Jesus asked them this question so that they would consider their own motives for following him. What do you want is a question to define your own motives. What do I want? John continues to tell this story by saying in verse 38, Jesus looked around and saw them following and said, what do you want? And they replied, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, what do you want? They said, we want to head where you're heading. We want to go where you're going. And so it was about four in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Jesus didn't just want people who walked around with him. He wanted people who knew him, had a relationship with him. Because can you sit in the same room with your brother or your sister and not know them? Can you be in the same place as your mother or your father and have zero relationship? Can you sit on the couch next to a spouse or a friend and be strangers? And why do we assume that proximity with God equals relationship? That sitting here will give us something meaningful. See, this matters. Church matters. Coming together matters but it doesn't do everything. Your everyday relationship with Christ enriches this experience. Our relationship with Christ is both communal and personal. And we walk the balance of both. And we fall out of touch with God when we fall one way or the other. Because relationship is a state in which two or more people is connected. And relationship with God isn't a once a week, I hope others see me status kind of thing. 
It's meaningful. It's sacrifice. It's walking with him. If not, then you're going to have religion without power. You're going to have the, the appearance without the spirit. And you're going to have the existence of emptiness clouded in self-deception. And I don't want that for you. And I don't want that for teenagers. That's why I tell them this. Because they think, oh, if I show up to church, I'm saved. But then why don't I feel God when I'm singing? Why don't I know how to pray? Why don't I feel connected to him? It's like, well, once a week won't cut it. The personal and the communal have to work together because proximity does not equal relationship and once a week proximity with him will never produce the relationship you seek. And that's why Jesus asked the question, what do you want? He wants to reveal your own motives through the question. Question number two, it's the identity question. So we had the motive question, now we have the identity question. What is your name? So we'll skip ahead a little bit into our next story, and we find ourselves in the book of Mark. Chapter four, Jesus and his disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm that rages up. You may or may not be familiar with the story. Jesus is snoozing under the boat. The disciples are pa panicking, and then Jesus calms the seas, and they make it across the water. Chapter five, we find ourselves getting off the boat, and Jesus and his disciples are confronted by a man that the Bible describes as possessed by an evil spirit. So this man was known as the guy who lived in the cemetery, cut himself with rocks, and would howl loudly in all hours of the night. What a guy. You think you have some strange people at work. This man was such a menace that the townspeople had at one point tried to restrain him with shackles around his wrists and his ankles, and he broke the chains. He was a wild man. He was a crazy man. Everyone knew him as the bleeding, howling, possessed guy who lived in the cemetery. What a label. <laughs> and it makes, me think of, it makes me think of a story. What a transition, right? It makes me think of a story of when I was a teenager and I decided to get a job. And so I was part-time at school. I went to a school where I could uh, take some classes in the morning in high school and then be homeschooled in the afternoon, and so I worked. So I worked at a job, at a place you may, may, or, not be, may or may not be familiar with it. Uh, it's called Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I didn't know if you guys knew it or not. Um, actually, my bosses were in, are you guys still in? Yeah, yeah, they're right there. So uh, they hired me. Thanks, Mike and Don. Uh, and uh, they hired me as the Chick-fil-A cow. Yeah. That was back when it was the mall. The mall was the only Chick-fil-A. And um, if you were there about 2008, 2009, saw a cow dancing around, maybe took a picture, I could be in your picture. You didn't even know it. Anyone at the mall 2008, 2009 dancing with a cow? Okay, yeah, some of you, okay. Hey, you never know, it could have been me. And so I was just kind of known as the cow guy, right? And this is what the cow guy does. He works for 40 minutes, drinks lemonade and eats chicken for 20 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't work hard, they just dance around in the suit, sweat a little bit, and hang out. Well, one day... They were a little low-staffed. Believe it or not, fast food places get low-staffed. And they're like, all right, well, the cow guy is going to have to do something for us. So they bring me in, and they have me start working in the store. And they're like, oh, maybe he's not just cow guy. Maybe he's Jesus chicken guy, you know? And so I started working in the store, breading chicken. And so I threw off the old label. I, I took that head with the broken fan in the top that haven't worked in 10 years, threw that thing, pulled off the suit that smelled like sweat from I don't know how many bodies over the years, although you guys did wash it, and it was probably my sweat. And I shed that label, and now I was Jesus chicken guy. It's great. I gave myself the label. They didn't give it to me, but it's fine. And it took a moment for me to realize that my identity wasn't tied up in just being some guy who danced around in the food court as a cow, we probably should have filed some reports against people. I was someone valuable. I was someone that was worth something. You could say I was given a new name. Let me tell you what happened here in Mark chapter five. 
Verse six, Jesus, when he was some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. If I'm the disciples, I'm freaked out. Like this man, he's bleeding, he's screaming, he's running. And Jesus is like, all right, bro. I know I'd be the other way. Verse seven, with a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Verse eight, for Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. This is an interesting note. Jesus had already tried to cast the demon out and it didn't leave. Whoa, that's something we can easily miss until Jesus did something. Verse nine, then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. The, name, the word for name in the Greek has a broader definition than what we might think of in English as like, my name is Matt. Onoma is this word in the Greek, and it's the manifestation or revelation of someone's character. It's saying, who are you? What is your name? What do people call you? How do you define yourself? And you know what spoke for him? Legion. I'm assuming that wasn't his actual name that he was given at birth. But it was the things that he picked up over time that started to find him so many that he couldn't sort them all out. See, Jesus was asking a question of identity. He was asking a question of reputation. He was asking a personal question to the crazy man. He wanted to know who they were. So where we in our own flesh would run away and be like, oh, I just want that to be that one person sitting on the street I don't talk to. Jesus said, I want to know his name. He made it personal. He wanted to know what defined this man, his reputation, what distinguishes him. He wanted to know his name. And I'm assuming most of you probably aren't sitting in here being possessed by a demon, but you probably have some labels. You probably have some things that you're carrying around that have started to define you. Maybe you're like, I'm the perfectionist. I make sure everything's right. I make sure everything goes exactly correctly. I'm the one to blame when things aren't precise. And so you set these standards for yourself where you can never succeed. Maybe you're like, I'm the successful one. I work hard, I never stop. I sacrifice everything, including my health, including my family, including everything. So no one can call me lazy. But all that does is lead you to a pit. Maybe you're like the everyone's friend and that's your label. Like everyone likes me, everyone's my friend. We talk to, we have, I have three billion friends on Facebook. You know, it's like I am, everyone likes me, but you bend your own convictions to match the situations that you're in. And you forget who you are. Maybe you're the person who never forgets. I'm never gonna forget what you did to me. I'm never gonna forget what you did to them. I'm gonna hold an account of everything that's happened. And all it does is fracture any good relationship you've ever had in your life because you have all the unforgiveness built up in your heart. Maybe it's more internal. Maybe it's like, I'm a failure. I mess things up. I always get fired. I always screw up the job. I always do this. I always do that. I'm not worth sticking around. You don't want me to do that. And it becomes a label that leads you to the pit. So I believe that any voice or anything inside of you that's not leading you to Christ isn't from Christ. And if that voice or that idea or that pattern behavior always leads you to the pit, then name it and abandon it. Because it's not for you. It's not from God or else it would lead you to him. See, if you don't define the problem, the problem will define you. You don't define what's going on, then it's always gonna hang out in the ether, in the cloud, and you're never gonna be able to figure out quite what that thing is. But once you call out its name, then you can be changed. That's what Jesus did. Because do you think that man's name was Legion overnight? It was a series of events, of labels, of mistakes that he picked up and threw on himself, and then it became normal, and then became him. And then he forgot that that thing led him to the pit every single time. 
But once the problem identified itself to Jesus, Jesus casted that identity out of the man and gave him a new reputation and a new name. In verse 15, this is how we describe the howling man who cuts himself who lives in the cemetery. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons and he was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. You ever try to make a life change and no one wants to accept you for the new life change? They're like, no, you're that. You're not this version, you're that version. It could be silly things or it could be big things. Like you start working out more or you start eating better or you lose some weight or you change, a, you, stop, you start reading books instead of sitting on your, you start doing something that you know is beneficial for you and then everyone else is like, who are you? You're not this person because you used to be in this box with these labels that I used to keep nice and safe over here. But Jesus says, I wanna give you a new name. Jesus is asking what our name is, how we define ourselves. Is it by past mistakes or regrets? Is it by baggage or pain that you carry from others? Is it by labels that you've put on yourself or just accepted as true that don't lead you to Christ? Because I know what my Bible says. It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. But he didn't just forgive us, he defined us in 1 John 3, 1, when he said, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. Our old mistakes, our old baggage, our labels, the person we used to be, when we walk with Christ, he gives us a new name. And it's not by effort, it's not by merit, it's being defined by him. I am a child of God. And that will redefine everything that you do. See, Jesus, let Jesus' words, not your sins, define you. And it will affect why you're here. So Jesus uses what is your name to change our identity to his. The third question, we're skipping through. Here's our third story, the trust question. Why did you doubt? To understand why we're here, we have to understand why we're doing something when it gets hard. And Jesus, to Peter, says, why do you doubt? Let me talk a little bit about the story so you know the context. In Matthew 14, in the beginning of the chapter, we find the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, once again, after ending a long day of ministry on the other side. So they fed 5,000 people, five loaves and two fish. It's a huge miracle Jesus does. Jesus is tired. He goes up to the hills and says, hey, I'm gonna pray and relax. He's like, you guys go on ahead. I'll catch up with you. Now, in my mind, I'm like, well, how is Jesus gonna catch up if they got the boat? They're going to the other side. But I don't know. Jesus has his ways, right? And if you're familiar with the story, you might know what I'm gonna share with you is his ways. So the disciples are crossing the water. Huge wind starts to blow up. The waves are tossing. The disciples are frightened. And it's the middle of the night. The Bible says it's the fourth watch of the night. Our guess is that's about 3 a.m. So when no one's awake, right? And the disciples are looking out over the water. They're awake because the waters are rough. They can't sleep. And the disciples see what they think is a ghost. Not in a boat. Walking on the water. Now, you may have heard the reference of Jesus walking on the water. Here's your story. And Jesus just walking on the water. And Peter's like, Lord, is that you? <laughs> Let me read what, what he says after that, 14, 29 through 31 of Matthew. He says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. So Jesus calls him out and says, it's me, come on. So Peter hops out of the boat and walks towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. In my mind, I'm like, oh, Jesus is gonna help him out. Be like, hey, you know, good job, you got out of the boat. No, this is how Jesus responds. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him and said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt me? Wow, that's kind of harsh, Jesus, right? Like the dude got out of the boat, the guy walked across the water, the other 11 are sitting in the boat and he takes it almost all the way to Jesus. It says that Jesus had his hand out reaching for him. So he was within arm's length of Jesus 
And Jesus says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt me? For some of you, you might relate to this. You've taken a step of faith in your life. You did something you felt like God told you to do. Switched jobs. You made a new thing. And instead of it getting easier, it got harder. You're like, wait a second. I thought me plus God equals easy. <laughs> That's our assumption, right? We naturally think that. But in all reality, in the step of faith we see here, it got harder. It wasn't the wrong thing, but it got harder. See, Peter took a step out of the boat, risking sinking, right? You know, he could have just stepped out and just went, whoop, and there I go, okay. He risked being made fun of by the other 11 guys, because you know if there's 12 guys hanging out and one guy does something dumb, they're all gonna make fun of him for the rest of his life, right? Like, oh, you walked on water, Peter. Good work, do it again, you know? I know I would do that. That's probably why I wasn't a disciple. And so they're in this situation, and Peter put himself out there. He thought he was doing God's will, and it got harder. And I know you can relate to that, because you thought you were doing God's will, but your life got harder. Your relationships got more complicated. The people at your job didn't treat you the same. Your kids are asking why you changed so much. You're like, God, I thought it was supposed to be easier. And I love how Jesus' response was, why did you doubt? In some ways, I hear him almost saying, do you trust me? Do you trust me? You know, just this summer, you know, like I said, my daughter, she's two and a half, and she, she's been loving to swim. Uh, she loves swimming. She's got a little puddle jumper. She likes to run around and swim. So we were at my sister's pool this summer, and, you know, just swimming, having a good time. So I jump off the diving board, right? I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I jump off the diving board. And so my daughter's like, of course, I'm two and a half. I'm going to jump off the diving board. And so she goes up there, and she jumps off the diving board. Okay, now I'm a good dad. I'm underneath, ready to catch her, right? I'm not like sitting over sipping a LaCroix, like, good job. <laughs> Hope you don't drown, right? I'm sitting there underneath her, ready to catch her. And she loved it so much. She kept doing it over and over and over again, I'm, like 30 million times. Like so many times that I got annoyed that she was doing it so much, right? Like, all right, I'm going to drown because this is a deep pool. But she had a blast. She loved it. So then fast forward to a, few, to a few weeks ago, we were at my wife's aunt's pool. In-ground pool, have a diving board. I'm like, all right, this is great. I'm gonna take her, we're gonna jump off the diving board, we're gonna have a lot of fun, she's not gonna get bored, you know, like we're gonna have a good time. So I go up, I do the same thing, I jump off the diving board. And I wait, I'm like, say, look, come here, I got you. She took one look at the diving board, one look at me, and she said, and started backing away. And then she wouldn't even jump off the edge of the pool. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I'm the same dad, same diving board. It's a pool of water, but somehow she's not gonna jump. And if you're following with me, you probably know where this is going. It's the same God, the same Father who loves you, sitting at the edge, waiting for you. And he said, I haven't forgotten you. I'm right here. Remember, we've done this before. Just because you got out of the boat doesn't mean the faith is over. There's more. It's the same father that's always there waiting to catch, waiting to hold you, to be there with you. She, she let the fear of the jump outweigh her trust in the father. And we ask the question, why do you doubt? Because I don't want your fear of trusting him to outweigh your trust in him. See, our physical situation is often a misrepresentation of spiritual reality. I'm gonna say that again. Our physical situation is often a misrepresentation of the spiritual reality. Peter was on the waves. He's walking on water. The winds are howling. It's dark outside. He's terrified. But also, in that moment, he's closer to Jesus than he had been. He stepped out in faith. It was harder, but he was closer to Jesus. 
So Jesus outstretched his hand and pulled him out, out of the water. See, we forget when life gets hard or it doesn't go quite the way we thought it would, or we're like, hey, God, I'm not down for this. He's like, hey, I'm the, still the same God. I'm the one who called you out, and I'm gonna get you there. The same God who called you out of the boat will get you to him. You can say it this way, the same God who got you here will get you there. So Jesus uses the why did you doubt question to build trust in him. That's why we ask that question. Why am I here? Do I trust him? Do I trust that I'm in the right place at the right time? Or if I'm not, do I trust to shift? Even though it's scary, even though it's not comfortable, but I know it's from him. And the last but not least, the last question here we have for you this morning is the mission question. Jesus asked the question, do you love me? It's a question of mission. It's a question of purpose. It's an intimate question. If you've ever been asked that question, it's not a comfortable question to answer. Do you love me? But this is where we find Jesus at the end of his life in John chapter 21. He's already died, already come back. He's kind of having his last words with his bros before he goes up into heaven. And this is one of our last stories that we encounter. It's a conversation between Jesus and Peter. John records it this way in 21 verse 15, he says, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. There's an interesting nuance to this story that we don't quite catch in the English, and I've referred to the Greek a few times through today because the New Testament was written in Greek, translated into English, and there's a little nuance here that sometimes we don't catch when we read the story because we're just kind of like, all right, Jesus, why are you saying this over and over again, right? So there's four different words for love. Greek kind of... Uh, distributes the definitions where English kind of sums it all up in love. And so there's four different definitions of love in the Greek that is used um, in the Bible. The first one is this word storge, which means familial bond. So it's love between family. It's like, I gotta love you because we're related, right? Storge. The second word is eros, which is romantic love. It's love between people who are interested in each other, want to spend their life together. The, la uh, the third one is philea, which is the love between friends. You know, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's where you get that concept from, philea. And then the last word is agape, which is an all-encompassing love from God. It's everything, every part of you, every aspect of your life. A love that only God does perfectly, but we strive for. And so we have these four different loves. And so in this passage, if you re read it again, What's actually happening here is that Jesus says to Peter, do you agapes me? To which Peter replies, of course I phileia you. And not chick phileia. Someone said that in first service. I phileia you. To which Jesus asks again, do you agapes me? Probably guess what Peter said. Of course I phileia you. See, in this moment, what we don't realize in the English is that Peter, after everything they've been together, three and a half years of travel, Jesus died, came back from the dead. You know, Peter betrayed him. Jesus still invited him in. Jesus, uh, Peter still put Jesus in the friend zone. Anyone been friend zone before? No, you don't have to tell me. If you don't know what that means, that means someone says, I like you in this category. I'll be your friend at work but don't, don't even try to message me. I'll be your friend at our family parties every two years. Outside of that, don't even try to look at me, right? You're in this box and I'll be friends with you there, but you're not gonna have all of me. Like we're friends, we'll talk about these certain things, but not everything. So Peter, friend, friend zones Jesus, the son of God, 
Though he saw miracles, he's like, yeah, of course I fully you, God. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> and the question of do you love me reveals our perception of Jesus. Do we love him with everything? Or do we love him in categories? Is it boxes or all of us? Because what's interesting, Jesus doesn't just say, do you love me? And he's like, he wants Peter to just say, I love you back. He wants Peter to have action to the words. He says, if you love me, feed my sheep. So what are the sheep? The sheep are the things that Jesus cares for. The sheep are us, God's people, those who follow him, even those who don't. He says, if you love me, you will care for those that I care for, which is mankind. See, I think at this moment, at the end of Jesus' time on earth, I think he was reflecting towards his heart that he shared with his disciples way back in the beginning of his life, uh, of ministry. In Matthew chapter nine, Jesus says this about the sheep that he cares for that he's now asking Peter to tend. He says, when he saw the crowds... He had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like, and here's the metaphor, sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Jesus is saying, Peter, who's going to carry on my legacy? Who's going to keep my work going? They're only gonna have me in person for three and a half years and then who's gonna carry it on? Jesus had already declared that Peter was the rock that he was gonna build his church upon. And he's like, Peter, do you love me? With everything, with all facets of your life. Are you gonna be on my mission, not just lip service, but by how you live? And Peter, in all his greatness in the Bible, puts Jesus in the friend zone. He says, sure, I fillet you. <laughs> sure, I love you as a friend. So we'll finish up the story, and this is where we're going to land today. John goes on to record the story in chapter, or verse 17 when he says, the third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Guess what word he used here? Phileo. He said, do you at least love me like a friend? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him for a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter also responds in that word phileo. Now, what's interesting is there's kind of echoes here of redemption between when Peter denied Jesus three times and now being able to say, yes, I love you three times. So Jesus is saying, in the past, you rejected me. <laughs> in the past, you denied my existence. I don't wanna care about that. Will you love me now? Will you prove it by your life? Will you be on mission for what I care for? Will you love what I love? Will you care for what I care for? Will you do what I was already doing? Will you continue on the work? Will you have the purpose that I've given you? Jesus right here is telling Peter why he's here. And I wanna tell you that an unconditional love for someone is proven through action. If someone gives you lip service, say, oh yeah, of course I love you, and they don't show up by their actions, do you believe them? If you come here and saying, oh, Jesus, I love you, you're worthy, but you don't live it. And it's no wonder that we're lost or confused. And that's why I believe you came here today, not to get all the right answers, but to have the right question. I hope one of these questions resonate with you about your purpose, maybe here in this building or in your family or in your community or at your job, to refocus your life 
to help you understand your identity. What's your name? To understand your journey of faith where it's been hard. But Jesus is calling out to you saying, why did you doubt? I'm the same God. Or maybe it's just a, a thing of mission, a focus, getting realigned in the right direction. You kind of forgot in the race of life, you're kind of going around in circles and circles in your job, doing the same thing and your family doing the same thing and you forgot you're caring for his sheep. Whether you're at home with your family, you feel purposeless because you're stuck at home, or maybe you're at a job and you're like, no one around here loves Jesus. Pastor Matt, if I told you the things they said, you wouldn't believe me. I've heard a lot of things. I work with teenagers, probably wouldn't believe you. They're still his sheep and they're lost without a shepherd. And God's called you to them in that place, in that season, for that time. Your family, your neighborhood, your job. So why don't you consider, why are you here? See, Jesus uses the do you love me question to inspire action for his mission. The questions are powerful. They inspire action. And I hope one of these questions have latched onto you today because if you're unclear about your motives, maybe ask yourself, what do you want? Maybe you never really thought about it. Maybe you have a distorted identity. You're like, I'm not legion, but I got a lot of labels on me that people don't like, that I get judged for. Ask Jesus, what is my name? Maybe you're just failing in your trust in God. You're like, Pastor Man, I'm not just sinking, I'm drowning. <laughs> I thought I did the right thing, but I'm lost now. Ask yourself, ask Jesus, why did I doubt? And finally, feel like you're stuck. Feel like you're floating aimlessly. Do I love him? What's my mission? Because I truly believe the right question at the right time will change your life. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this time to reflect on your word. God, to consider the things that you're doing in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're the great question asker. God, that you pull responsibility out of us. You pull action out of us. You call us out of the stands and onto the field and you say, do something with your life. Consider where you're at. And God, I'm thankful that you gave us the right questions to consider those things. So I pray as we leave this place, we will follow you faithfully. Lord, I pray the church wouldn't just become a routine or a ritual, but we become a place of refreshment and of encouragement because our, it's an enhancement of our daily walk with you. Lord, I pray for those who maybe not asked you personally to be their Lord, personally to walk with you. Lord, I pray that they're like those two guys who said, I heard about this Jesus guy. I don't know what he's about, but I'm gonna follow him and figure out on the way. Lord, I pray today in their hearts, confess their sins and walk with you. So Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing. And we pray these things in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was a blessing to share with you. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up our service today by, by saying out in the lobby, if you wanna sign up for a life groups, what a great way to change your routines, get out of the, the mundane of life. Also, this Wednesday, we'll have an extra service. It's our first Wednesday. And then our youth life groups will start on September 14th, which is two Wednesdays from now. So if you're a youth student, come on out to that. It's Wednesday night, 6.30. We would love to have you. So thank you. Have a blessed Labor Day. And we'll, we'll see you later.